they asked me to provide you with a little bit of a bio because I guess uh, Obama kept saying he was an unlikely candidate uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, uh, the, the bio material on me is a little uh, somewhat important, not because I have a horn to toot, but I'm somewhat of an unlikely presenter at a gathering like this. Um, I, I would think it's safe to say if there's three or four hundred people here, I'm probably the only Baptist pastor here. Um, but I, I go at Christianity, go at Jesus following from an anarchist, nonviolent uh, perspective, and am passionate about social justice issues, primarily uh, racial reconciliation, nonviolence and all the stuff that's wrapped up in consumerism. Uh, it took me 30 minutes at Target the other day to find a pair of socks made in the United States. And I, I'm not, you know, it's, it's not because I'm waving the flag, you know, by American. It's because I, have a, I don't want to put something on my feet that a 12-year-old girl in Cambodia made for 27 cents a day whose uncle sold her into wage slavery, you know, because of that, that kind of stuff. And that's, been, that's one of my newer passions, consumerism and getting connected to the means of production and sustainability and all that. So those are my big three, racial reconciliation, nonviolence, and, and the ramifications of capitalist consumerism and all that that does to us. Um, so. That being said, uh, the topic of our conversation today is anarchism toward social justice. I think it's very important, first off, to try to get a working definition of what it is we're talking about. What's the first thing pops into your mind when you hear anarchist or anarchism? Just, just some little, like, popcorn words. Huh? No, Okay. Okay. Anything? Anything else? Okay. Disorder. Disorder. Yes. Chaos. Chaos. All right. Good. Well, the thing I run into most of the time is, is, is some version of bomb-throwing youth who didn't get what they wanted during the punk music movement, so now they're going to blow everything up, you know burn it or blow it up or whatever, yee-haw, no gods, no masters, uh, let's wreck everything. And that seems to be the popular conception. When the news media uses the word anarchist to describe something or anarchy to describe something, what is the visual image that usually accompanies that word on the news broadcast? Riots, Riots burning cars, blowing up buildings, all that sort of stuff. But the problem even goes over into or cross-pollinates into anarchist circles. We have a hard time defining who we are. And that's there, if you do a, like a web search or something like that, you find anarcho-primitivists, uh, eco-anarchists, anarcho-syndicalists, communitarian anarchists, and, and uh, Cafe Press has a whole, about two pages of different stars with the different colors, because there's code on the colors for what kind you are and all of that sort of stuff. So they even have a hard time defining it. So I wanted to start out with a working definition of what it is and then hopefully we can connect the dots. And just about everything I'm going to say is on the, on, on the handout. But it isn't necessarily chaos. It might be disorientation or dis institutionalism, but it isn't necessarily chaos. It isn't even necessary, re necessarily revolutionary because um, one of the things uh, anarchism rejects about revolution is because revolution simply replaces one power with another. Now you're for it if your team wins and, and you think your team is, is for the greater good of everybody else, but basically you're uh, replacing one oppressive government with another one. So they aren't even necessarily revolutionary in that sense of the term. On your paper, we have three dictionary definitions. That's a decent place to start. 
Anarchism is the philosophy of a new social order based on liberty, unrestricted by man-made law, the theory that all forms of government are based on violence. I inserted coercion and dominance there, those are my words. Hence, wrong and harmful, as well as unnecessary. Then if we take the progression, anarchy is the absence of government, disbelief in and disregard of invasion and authority based on coercion and force, a condition of society regulated by voluntary agreement, the co-op, the commune, the syndicate. In example, communitarian anarchism or anarcho-syndicalism instead of government. And then an anarchist would then be a believer in anarchism, one opposed to all forms of coercive government and invasive authority. One who advocates anarchy or absence of government as the ideal of political liberty and social harmony. Does that make sense? Are those just words on a page? Questions, comments? Does that ring true with your understanding of anarchism? Okay. Well, one of my favorite authors is Noam Chomsky. And he helps us understand this, or he fleshes it out a little bit in the quote on the bottom of the page. So after we uh, take a look at this, uh, then I want to hear from you a little bit on how you think this fleshes out and maybe get some of your ideas on how this might relate to social justice. Chomsky wrote, uh, uh, or, or actually he's quoting Daniel Gurian, stating anarchism is not a fixed, self-enclosed social system, but rather a definite trend in the historic development of mankind, which in contrast with the intellectual guardianship of all clerical and governmental institutions strives for the free, unhindered unfolding of all the individual and social forces in life. Even freedom is only relative, not an absolute concept, since it tends constantly to become broader and to affect wider circles in more manifold ways. For the anarchist, freedom is not an um, abstract philosophical concept, but the vital concrete possibility for every human being to bring to full development all the powers, capacities, and talents with which nature has endowed him or her and turned them into social account. The less this natural development of man is influenced by ecclesiastical or political guardianship, the more efficient and harmonious will human personality become. So what is, how, how might that apply to social justice and moving towards social justice? If we have these more just social relations and if we move toward a concrete possibility of freedom. Are you free? Yeah, go ahead. It, um, it places on us a, a personal responsibility that um, we've popularly been ad sort of advocating to our governmental body. That is, when there's a genocide in Rwanda, we say, well, the government really needs to take care of that. Yeah. You know, somebody should really get out there and take care of that. Why didn't they do anything, huh? And um, to, to, accept, to accept this as true is to accept personal responsibility for all sorts of things that we don't. Uh-huh. One of the critiques against anarchism is it's too individualistic. But I think that's a little bit of a, of, of, of a confusion because anarchism starts with the individual and individual responsibility and individual association with others, but it does not stay there. It doesn't leave people there. Um, can, are, are all people, do all people have the same capabilities? Physically? No. Emotionally? No. So forth. So if you are lacking something, whatever, I don't know. Um, let's say you're not hugely strong and you want to build a fire pit in the backyard to grill your veggies on or whatever, but those cinder blocks aren't going anywhere as long as it depends on you to do it, well, how would you solve that problem? Yeah, sure. If she can't haul the cinder blocks, she finds somebody who does. And in an anarchist way of looking at things, the person who hauls the cinder blocks for her doesn't do it out of obligation, uh, doesn't do it out of duty, but does it because they enjoy doing it because that's what they do. You know, it, it's hard to nail down. It gets a little, little willy-nilly. Now, 
Any of you, over the course of this afternoon's discussion, I may use a couple of illustrations from our uh, uh, democracy conversation right before lunch. So if you were in that with me, those are not personal shots at the presenter. I don't know her. I have utmost respect for that organization and what they're trying to do, but I grinned about a half a dozen times in uh, you know, comments like, I don't know if we really have a voice, but as long as people think they do, that's what's important. You know, in, in an anarchistic orientation towards social justice, everybody does have a voice. And, and it gets messier and harder and more difficult. What does he mean by uh, political and ecclesiastical uh, guardianship? That we need to be free from that to move towards social justice in an anarchistic way. What, is that, what bell does that ring in your mind? What's political guardianship? Colonialism. Yep, colonialism would be an example of that. Sure. How many of you were told to do your civic duty on Tuesday? That's political guardianship. How many of you were told if you don't vote, you don't have any right to say anything? Yep. My associate pastor got up on Sunday before... Uh, the vote and told everybody to go out and do their civic duty on Tuesday. I had to scold him afterwards. I said, it's a temporary privilege extended to us by the powers that be. And if people want to exercise that privilege, then fine and dandy. But once it becomes a duty, it becomes oppressive. It's really a misnomer to say what we practice is democracy, because this isn't a democracy, it's a republic. And, and we're giving a very small group of individuals the power to make decisions for us. And so we're abdicating democracy in favor of a republic. And I, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying I, we need to get our terminology correct and stop fooling ourselves uh, and, and talking about democratic. I mean, we use some democratic means to keep the machinery of our republic oiled, but there is that alienation. You're just, I'm just uh, um, what Marx has to say about alienation fits perfectly with what you're talking about with some of the problems with voting and apathy and uh, having a voice and all of that kind of stuff. Well, and there's even a, I don't want to spin too far off into the vote or not vote kind of thing because that's, that's not the central issue here. But there's also a hierarchy of that. I mean, you, you, if you live in a little village and, and you're making some decisions about the village, then, and everybody really does have a voice, then I think even an anarchist might vote in that kind of a situation um, because they really do have a voice and it really is something of a council. Some people call it council communism. We're starting off with trying to come with a common understanding of what anarchism is, and that's one of the reasons I juxtaposed, say, voting in a national election with actually participating in a community decision. When I said uh, an anarchist might, might very possibly participate in a village vote. Right, where but they, they also participate in a national election vote because if they have a commitment to social justice, they want to contribute to it as much as possible, even if they're stuck under a regime that isn't an anarchist regime, they would, they would feel a need to contribute to their society by participating in it. And without, because if you just ignore anything that deals with you know, exploitation or domination, then you're not a true anarchist, you're just lazy. You know what I mean? So well, that's, that's a side of the argument, but I, I, have, to, I have to say that it's a valid argument but it's definitely a minority argument within anarchist circles. And, but it's a valid argument. I mean, and, and it would be uh, patently absurd uh, for me as Anarchist A to try to force you as Anarchist B to, to, to go about it my way. I, I'm doing broad strokes, and, and there may be streams within who, who are perfectly comfortable with participation in institutional politics, but most would not be comfortable with participating in institutional that's politics. Most. That's a point that was made early on, that pinning it down and defining it is very, very difficult to do.
Even in Chomsky's book on anarchism, he bemoans that. And when he speaks at anarchist conferences, whichever group is putting on the conference wants to back him into the corner and, and see if he's their kind or not. So, and that's one of the reasons at the outset I, sa I confessed that I'm going to try to paint with really broad strokes. And if there's 10 anarchists in the room, you might have nine different opinions about whether those strokes are coming out of the right bucket of paint or not. I am primarily coming from a communitarian anarchist position, expressly nonviolent communitarian anarchism. And that cuts me out of a big piece of the pie right out of the get-go uh, uh, because of the nonviolence piece. And, and so that, that's my bias, that's my perspective, that's where I'm coming from, but yes. And that's one of the problems, it's one of the challenges, is, is uh, anarchist movements have disintegrated for two primary reasons. Either the powers that be, like in Spain, were able to come in and destroy the movement, or it destroyed itself from within haggling over definitions like in the late 19th century Russia and, and as it tried to spread into Europe. And, and one of the reasons those movements have, have disintegrated or at least evaporated down to a remnant is all the different branches of the tree. And if the branches forget about the trunk, you know, yeah. That's one of the huge questions and one of the problems with moving it towards social justice that, that we'll get to in, in just a little bit is who defines justice? Yeah. Who's justice? And, and for me, that's one of the reasons I believe this to be the best platform from which to work toward justice because justice can be very parochial or paternalistic too. And, and it, it's based in a trust a trust in, in collectives of human beings figuring out what's best for them. And as they figure out what's best for them, as long as it isn't instituting a, some form of coercion or dominance on another people group or within, then therefore it is just. And, and so it's even the definition of justice is somewhat dynamic. And that, that's what we're talking about here where it uh, talks about the dynamic difficulties says, anarchism is a slippery tool to use toward justice because of its dynamic nature founded on voluntary association and process. Jacques Ellul wrote that anarchism is the fullest and most serious form of socialism. And that socialism is defined by Marx, uh, not by Sarah Palin. <laughs> I mean, Marx believed we were social beings and that we discover our fullest potential in social relationships and social arrangements. And anarchism relies on that as a, as a truth about human nature and about sociology. And Jacques Ellul uh, wrote that. Many writers have referred to anarchism as libertarian socialism. Dynamic, voluntary social arrangements are difficult to nail down and codify, and can be quite un unattractive to individuals seeking codified tenets of justice, or worse, who seek to impose justice through systems of domination and coercion. It's hard. It's messy. Because there isn't this codified... Now, when you center anarchism around a particular issue, like eco-anarchism, or anarcho-feminism, or anarcho syndicalism or anarcho-primitivism, then, then you have some more clearly defined, narrower parameters to try to sort it out and, and to focus it. It becomes uh, a bad analogy for a, a pacifist to use, but it becomes a rifle instead of a shotgun. You know, and, and what we're talking about here is kind of shotgun anarchism, I guess, because it goes, it, it splatters all over the place. And we got to have a Dylan quote. See, those of you that heard my cell phone uh, ring a little bit, I, at least I'm not doing an Aussie quote. Um, <laughs> to live outside the law, you must be honest. It's hard not to have it nailed down. It's hard 
when I pastor a church, there's always a, a significant percentage of people within the church that want me to tell them what to do because I'm the pastor. And when I refuse to tell them what to do, but rather wax more philosophical or theological about the conundrum facing them and tell them I trust them to figure it out, it can be very, very troubling. And, and that's one of the troubling things about anarchism is because of this lack of, of a codified type way of going through it. And it's dynamic. It's not static. It, it, it's this constantly developing... And that's very difficult for me, being a 51-year-old white male of Midwestern agricultural Dutch descent, descent. It's very difficult for me to embrace something dynamic and changing and fluid and, and, and all of that. It's almost counterintuitive. But part of that is the attraction, too. We could get into a conversation about the difference between an institution and an organism. I mean, an organism is fluid and growing and evolving, but it's definitely very organized. But yet, it's, you know, I'm going to be very different, at least on a cellular level tomorrow, than I am today. And, and But I'm not, you know, I, I understand what you mean, and that's one of the frustrations, is... How can we organize? How can we move forward? How can we address some of these concerns without betraying who we are as anarchists? And that is a valid frustration, if, that, if I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah, and that, it gets into the next statement here, where it says, anarchism can be disorienting because it is ultimately an approach to social life and social relations that is no particular orientation at all. This disorientation of anarchism values uncertainty and unrealized understandings and view the, views these and this journey as the essence of social life. That's one person's opinion. Okay? Can there be justice? All right, now we're getting to the justice piece, which is the other half of this whole deal. Can there be justice without nailing down the rules? Is it possible to establish or move toward justice without saying you must drive 55. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I don't know, I find it difficult to see that happen. I think it's very ideal to think that it would happen just because um, as human beings, uh, we have this tendency to want to have power over you know, another human being um, based upon any difference that that may, person may have, whether it be class, mm -hmm. race, religion, uh, whatnot. Um, but I think in order to have a, a just society, and if it was going to be on a world scale, we would, there would have to be some set of basic principles of mm -hmm. human nature, just basic human, you know, inalienable rights, so to speak. But just basic, you know, everyone is human beings, if you, this, this, like, not even delineating like, what makes human, just saying, these are human beings, human beings can't be treated like this, human beings can be treated like this. And there needs to be penalties for so does every that don't does every generation need a Moses? I don't think it's I don't I think we need a Moses right now. Okay. I think we need something that where we can actually because no one knows who's equal. We're treating everyone like you know we don't know anyone. We're killing people for raw materials and mm -hmm. we have no sense of what life means or the sanctity of life whatsoever. Okay. So I think we do need to set up some type of standard where you know. People are, we're human beings. There's a lot of sociologists that look into this and how they can create, you know, human rights. And the United States, we go to these countries saying they're living life the wrong way. They're treating women wrong. They're doing this, this, and this, and this. In our own country, women still don't make the, the same wages as men. You mm -hmm. know, like, there's tons of different rights that just haven't been established in our own country. So maybe we need to yep. look inward before we look outward. What I want to do, just a minute, I don't want to cut off any of the questions or comments that are here, so hold on to them. But I, I want to race ahead a little bit just to make sure that we get to two of the foundational parts of, of you know, the justice, the justice part of this and the why not depend on the government to fix it for us part of this, okay? So I want to race ahead a little bit and hold on, you know, just so we're able to get those last two chunks in in the time remaining. Before we get to the justice piece, we have to talk a, a little bit about freedom because 
I believe that one of the, f if, there's, if there's something that can be nailed down as an absolute within anarchism, it's freedom. But our definitions of freedom vary. Did, I don't know, did you, my little quip I made about voting where it's not a duty or a freedom, it's a privilege and we live in a country of temporary privileges which can be removed at any time. So think about what freedom is here a moment, and, and I'll read this piece from Lucy Parsons. Uh, free, any discussion of anarchism towards social justice must include the mention of freedom. In anarchist thought, freedom is an ultimate goal and the ultimate justice. In a lecture entitled The Principles of Anarchism, given in the late 19th century by Lucy Parsons, she said, the philosophy of anarchism is included in the word liberty, yet it is comprehensive enough to include all things else that are conducive to progress. No barriers whatever to human progression, to thought, or investigation are placed by anarchism. Nothing is considered so true or so certain that future discoveries may not prove it false. Therefore, it has but one infallible, unchangeable motto, freedom. Freedom to discover any truth, freedom to develop, to live naturally and fully. Other schools of thought are composed of the crystallized ideas or principles that are caught and impaled between the planks of long platforms and considered too sacred to be disturbed by a close investigation. In all other issues, there is always a limit, some imaginary boundary line beyond which the searching mind dare not penetrate, lest some pet idea melt into a myth. But anarchism is the usher of science, the master of ceremonies to all forms of truth. It would remove all barriers between the human being and natural development. From the natural resources of the earth, all artificial restrictions that the body might be nurtures. And from universal truth, all bars of prejudice and superstition that the mind may develop symmetrically. That's a mouthful, and I, that, that's a tiny, itty-bitty snippet from her lecture. And I, I don't know how long that lecture went, but it took me almost an hour just to read it. <laughs> so she must have had a real good audience. Uh, um, does that resonate with your con concepts of what freedom is? What do you understand freedom to be? And are you able to live in a world or in a social arrangement that is that free? I don't know. Think about it a little bit. I'm still wrestling with that one myself. All right, a starting point within anarchist thought pointing toward justice. To faithfully explore anarchism toward social justice, we must determine a starting point, a basic means of movement, as well as the for and against of an anarchism toward social justice. Let's forge ahead uh, through this next little bit of reading and then spend some time on the, discussing these core principles and what they mean to you. Because this is where I hope the rubber is going to begin to hit the road for you, that if you're exploring this, as a vehicle for your own living out of social justice efforts and stuff like that, beginning to explore what we're calling some of these core principles will, will be some of the, the meatier uh, part of this. Um, you all know that I, I'm coming from a Christian perspective, so some of the people I'm going to quote are Christian anarchists, and this is from Jacques Ellul, uh, uh, sociologist, social critic, theologian. Uh, Christianity, authentic biblical Christianity, means a rejection of power and a fight against it. If I rule out violent anarchism, there remains pacifist, anti-nationalist, anti-capitalist, moral, and anti-democratic anarchism. An example, that which is hostile to the falsified democracy of bourgeois states. There remains the anarchism which acts by means of persuasion. Now we're getting into the methodology here a little bit, or at least what I'm suggesting. Uh, by the means of persuasion, by the creation of small groups and networks, denouncing falsehood and oppression, aiming at a true overturning of authorities of all kinds as people at the bottom speak and organize themselves. I believe that anarchy first implies conscientious objection to everything that constitutes our capitalist or degenerate socialist and imperialistic society, whether it be bourgeois, communist, white, yellow, black, Conscientious objection is objection not merely to military service, but to all the demands and obligations imposed by our society, to taxes, to vaccination, to compulsory 
schooling, etc. That's Jacques Ellul's understanding of it, and uh, he wrote this book when he in 1988. Uh, he was in his late 70s then, and I think he passed away in his early 90s. So this was getting near the end of his journey. He was a socialist in pre-World War II France. Anarchism towards social justice can serve as an antidote to paternalistic justice or institutional constructs towards social justice that rely on hierarchy and domination themselves to impose so-called justice. The anarchistic ideal is that a voluntary association or organization toward a social organism that is inherently more just in that these voluntary organisms stand in opposition to injustice and toward the deconstruction of unjust arrangements and the establishment of just relations. I just talked about, then I just cite a few writers. Many writers, both religious and secular, over the last two centuries have embraced a method and orientation toward social transformation along the lines of voluntary association from communal socialism of Peter Kropotkin or to the more individu individualistic forms embraced by Bakunin, uh, Friedrichs, uh, activist, pacifist anarchism, so on and so forth. And th this was one of the things I said I was going to mention something about the uh, uh, democracy group uh, that I sat in before lunch. Uh, the person who was presenting there said it was really good that you, many of you students are involved in these different social justice type, type things, you know, the rape crisis center, the homeless shelter, uh, you know, whatever you, your issue is, uh, global warming type stuff, recycling type stuff, uh, uh, vegan, vegetarian issues, all of those kind of things. But, but the, the opinion of the presenter there was that that all falls short. It's too little too late, too slow, that the only real effective way to accomplish anything is politically and, and by engaging in, in the, the larger political prospect. I would say from, from the anarchist point of view that I sit in, I would disagree with that and say that these groups of voluntary associations that stand against and stand for are the best, most effective most catalytic way to accomplish real change rather than just institutional reshuffling. The deck chairs of the U.S. of America Titanic were rearranged on Tuesday. Now it remains to be seen whether the rip in the side of the hall will be prepared or not, repaired or not, if that's an apt deal. I don't know. I don't know if the ship's going to continue sinking or if Admiral Obama will get her fixed. But as far as right now, while the jury is out, all we know is that the deck chairs have been rearranged and reoriented. We shall see what happens. Um, so, and then right on the bottom, right below what I just read, I've listed what I believe to be four core principles of anarchistic social justice efforts. Freedom, I don't know where it's on on your page. Freedom. Core Principles of Anarchistic Social Justice it came, it comes right after what I just read. Got it? Oh, it's on the top of your page. I shrunk yours down to save paper, see? And I didn't even say environmentalist. <laughs> Freedom, voluntary association, opposition to all that is hierarchical, oppressive, and based on domination, <coughs> education, and the undermining or making irrelevant of all institutions of domination and oppression. That's what I've listed as the core principles. I uh, came to a crossroads where I became so disillusioned with the political promises of whatever party I tended to be following and so disillusioned with the abject corruption of everybody, except maybe Paul Wellstone, uh, that that I stopped thinking on those large macro levels. Even uh, my disappointment in revolutionary movements that I thought might have been the real deal, like Ortega in Nicaragua, and he became just as despotic and violent and oppressive as the people he replaced, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, and then early on I said, you know, 
I, I don't consider this a revolutionary movement because one revolution, all it does is shuffle who's in power and who's doing the oppressing. It's like, you know, and, and so I, I can't answer your question, not that it's not a valid question, but I, I, think, I, I think much smaller. What can I do in my neighborhood? What can I do in Binghamton? Don't raise your hand, but how many people here shop at Walmart because it's cheap? Think? Huh? All right, so if you want to undermine capitalism, uh, then we, we stop prostituting ourselves to the Walmarts of the world. Personally, us, my family, we've intentionally reduced our household income by about 300% and learned to live on less. And we feel as a family that by going from a household income of 115 to 120 ish down to 30 ish that we at least as a family are beginning to undermine capitalism because when we were up there we were finding a way to spend it all and down here we're actually happier and more comfortable so that little drop in the bucket you know that's 70 grand that the capitalists aren't getting from us I still got a laptop though yeah <laughs> I just really don't see how anarchism on an economic and macro international sense can ever I mean, coordinate itself in a non-hierarchical or extremely bureaucratic way like participatory economics. It worked in Spain. Uh, where, where, seven this morning, but yeah, where the, the workers owned the means of production and it was working until it got meddled in by both the communists and the capitalists. I mean, America and England and Russia got Spain in, in their crosshairs and, and made sure it stopped working, but it worked for a while. Isn't it still active, the Madrigan Workers Co-op? To a degree. The Zapatistas, in, uh, I mean, they got a beautiful arrangement. Uh, Zapatistas in Mexico, but in Spain there's the Madrigan Workers Co-op. Yeah, yeah. And then I was just reading on my candy bar. The, the co-op in the Dominican Republic. I'm going there in February, I, actually. I want to try to find those, those people. There's micro <laughs> examples. The, the Bruderhof in Pennsylvania, uh, various Amish and Hutterite and Old Order Mennonite groups. I was sharing with them that we like to go shop at the Old Order Mennonite grocery north of Bainbridge because it's really, really cool and we're helping a sustainable community and, and blah, blah, and all that kind of stuff. And then I, I'm friends with a bunch of people that live in an inner city communist commune called Jesus People in Chicago, where they took over an old ho hotel called Friendly Towers. And, and they give uh, living space to 200 homeless elderly people and help take care of them. And, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So in, uh, I'm optimistic because I see all these micro, you know, a community of 200, a community of 50, uh, you know, and, and so forth, examples of entities that are able to renounce or significantly undermine capitalism and disengage from some of these systems that, that we mentioned without disengaging from society and culture and still do a, a positive good in the, in the setting that they're in. Yes? I'll talk a little bit about the Food Buying Club and maybe some people can make some connections. Okay. Um, for those of you from Binghamton, you may or may not know, down the north side of Binghamton, there is not a grocery store. There's been a fight for 15 years for a grocery store. It's a human rights issue. It's about food. Um, Binghamton Regional Sustainability Coalition has a, a food group, and you know, a subgroup, and they have started a food buying club, um, which is sometimes the first step in starting a food co-op. So we're, you know, we're starting small. Um, this first food buying group is going to be kind of the, the prototype because food buying groups only include about 10 people. So people join it for different reasons. Some people are joining it because they want to buy fresh and local produce and they want to support local farmers in New York. Some people are joining because it's cheap, but it's not answering all the problems of the North Side because they don't take EBT, you know, and some people, in order for it to answer the, you know, the food problems of low-income families on the north side, they need to take EBT. So it's the answer to some people's problems and not others. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Any comments on the what I what I've listed as the core principles of anarchistic social justice efforts? So we can flesh out what you mean by the educational aspect of it. What sort of education would be decentralized enough and informative enough to link the universal needs of the populace? Well, wow, to link the universal <laughs> needs of the populace. That would be my answer. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, gatherings like this are education. I mean, whether you, whether you buy what I'm selling or not, at least the word is going out. Or, or the conversations that occur before, after, and during and things. Those are efforts in our, uh, publication, alternative media. Those, those are ways that education, education within these loosely knit groups of people that gather around a common cause or something like that. And the other thing as it relates to justice is um, I can't speak to this real well because it's one of those things I, I read once a few weeks ago and it got my tuning forks going but I haven't processed it that much. But I think it was Emma Goldman was who I was reading at the time and it, I've got like five or six books going at once and I'm not, I misquote people a lot but I'm pretty sure it was Emma that was talking about some people don't know that they're living in an unjust situation until you inform them, you know, that, that, that you tell them. So that's part of the education is sharing with people, you don't have to live that way. Or if I can beat up on Walmart again, you don't have to buy cheap plastic crap cheaper. You know, you can't, you know, here are the alternatives kind of thing. So I think those are the two prongs of the education piece. Not only learning what's available, you know, learning about the Northside Neighborhood Association's food buying group and what they're trying to do, learning about alternatives to, I mean, I shared uh, a little while uh, early on that it took me 30 minutes to find a pair of socks at Target that were made in the United States uh, from some mill in, in North Carolina rather than sweatshop in Cambodia or something like that. Just now, now you all know if you want some socks that were produced under reasonably just conditions as opposed to those produced in Cambodia or whatever, that you have that option. You know, kind of, that's what I'm talking about by education. Not, not like institutional, not like a school of anarchism or something. I'm seeing a lot of diffuse thinking here, and, yeah. or I'm not catching it or both. Okay. Uh, and what I specifically am trying to uh, elicit from you is a, a, a clear idea of what educational organization or disorganization would be optimum. Well, speaking as an educator, I, I see many quote-unquote decentralized homeschool kids who come into uh, educational uh, venues after the fact who are not capable, socially integrated, cooperative, uh, maybe in an arbitrarily functional way, mm -hmm. um, and they are impacted significantly. There are remnant effects that precipitate into their college years. Now, there are shining examples contrary to that, mm -hmm. but I, I think uh, if we have a uh, educational principle that's crucial, I, I think we should have an educational um, organization that creates a an underpinning of humanism, um, compassion, compassion uh, as well as core concepts of understanding that uh, aren't necessarily in the home taught decentralized. Mm -hmm. I, from where I sit with anarchism, I think it would be very difficult to do that. I mean, I, I, I taught for about 15 years and come from a generation of teachers and I don't know that I could apply behavioral objectives to this. Maybe affective and behavioral, but the cognitive ones would get real tough. And, and the, you know, maybe the, like the homeschool kids' failure to assimilate into an institutional educational environment, maybe a lot of anarchists would say that's okay. Easy for them to say. I know. The child is very, very <laughs> upset, and the parents are dis, disgruntled. Uh, the system yeah. is uh, impacted up and down the line. Yeah, it's really um, it disrupts the system, than doesn't you it? Is what you're saying? No, not really, because I've gone all three ways with my kids. So education might be educating the homeschool parents about the ramifications of that choice. 
and saying, here's what you may very well face with your child educationally and socially and as far as the future, getting into college, you know, not having a regent's test to, to show the New York bureaucracy or, or whatever. So now, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but education may be that not allowing that family to just go blindly into that because a, 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 a political or religious figure tells them they ought to because of the evil public schools or something without helping them understand what the ramifications are. When we were, he was talking about personal responsibility early on, part of the educational mandate within anarchistic circles is to help people understand what the ramifications are of the choices that they make. And, and I, I don't know if that addresses your question uh, more clearly yeah, or not, but... Uh, you, way back there. We haven't heard from you yet. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that like a lot of the stuff that you're saying um, is stuff that like it's not like, necessarily anarchist, like to work on charity or to not buy from Walmart. So I'm not getting like that good of an idea oh, yeah. of what anarchism is. And then also, I think that you didn't really address this question that much about capitalism, and I'm still really curious to hear the answer to that because I thought it was like the most important. Okay, okay. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. Um, were you here during the, I mean, were, have I you been? I was here from the very beginning. Okay, so you're, what I'm hearing you say is that you didn't get enough on what anarchism is and. I don't think you okay. addressed his question. Oh, his? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I get that. I thought yours was a two-part thing. Number, okay, I'm not by, by. Okay, all right, let's get back to his in just a second here. But what I, uh, what I want to make clear is I'm not, by saying anarchism towards social justice, I'm not saying that anarchists have a corner on the market of working towards social justice or, or you know, when I talk about working in a soup kitchen or a rape crisis center or, you know, environmental efforts or, or, or whatever. I'm not saying anarchism is the best way or the only way. Or, or any, I mean, I'm saying it's a way to accomplish those kinds of things a little more differently without relying on the government to fix it for us. I understand what, like, what you're saying. Okay. That wasn't like, really what I was trying to say. All right, I didn't get you then. I'm sorry. I apologize. Like, like the stuff that you're, like, I'm getting out of this is hmm. okay. I can work in charity or I can not buy a Walmart. Like, those are things I'm already doing. I'm definitely not an anarchist. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not getting a better idea of how to fix the entire system, like capitalism isn't working. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could address this question. Well, my short, uh, my short answer to you is the entire system can't be fixed. It produces what it's designed to produce. And that living anarchistically is an alternative to relying on that system either to fix itself or to fix our problems or us jumping into the hamster wheel of trying to fix it ourselves. That it is well, it, capitalism produces exactly what it's designed to produce. It, I, I don't think there's any fix in it. That's why I was giggling about my new button because it said it, it, the work, workers, uh, IWW. yeah, yeah, uh, you know, say capitalism can't be reformed. It is what it is. It does what it does and relies on what it is. So I can't give you any ideas on how to fix it because. I, I don't know that it's broken. I think it's functioning very well and doing exactly what it's intended to do. And we did not get to the, so why not use, why not trust the government or institutional political process as the tool of justice? All right, that's where we left off. I've got about a page and a half on that for you, for your consideration. Another Lucy Parsons quote and a few other quotes, a Rousseau quote, uh, Chomsky, all kinds of people getting in there. I mean, who can forget after 9-11, our president told us to go shopping. Yeah. And that would fix everything, okay? So I'm just going to let this go and get a few more hands taken care of, and then we'll close on the capitalism question. And I, okay? Yes? I just want to make a quick note. Yeah. She was asking about. Um, I personally don't necessarily feel like not shopping, I don't shop at Walmart myself, but I don't feel like not shopping at Walmart is helping, is helping um, anybody because by 
Okay, if there is a sweatshop in Cambodia and mm -hmm. you go out of your way not to buy that product, mm -hmm. you are, I know, yes, in a way, it's, I mean, sweatshops are a very complicated issue, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of hard to, like, say my opinion in 30 seconds, but I just feel like if you're, you know, these women who are working at sweatshops, if their sweatshop closes down because they, the company that from the U.S. decides to outsource to a place in Mexico and mm -hmm. Cambodia, the, the sweatshop that closes in, Mex uh, in Cambodia, the women that work there, then are going to have to, you know, either get paid zero percent, you know, not work, mm -hmm. instead of getting paid 50 cents an hour or 10 cents an hour, they won't get any income whatsoever. It's better, to, I mean, they're poor, but it's, they're having some small income. And or if you don't do that, there are other options maybe, yeah. Maybe they'll have to leave the city and go back to their village and actually live a healthy life. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's really an option for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, well I, I know. But by, compar by comparison to slave labor, locked up 14 hours a day? Okay. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not fair to say that. No, I mean. The, the general, pr I understand your argument. I'm very anti-sweatshop, but I know. Be, it's not so individualistic. It's not, oh, I'm, it's a, I know. I I'm under a at Walmart. That's not. I understand. Personal. My dad worked at Walmart the last six years of his life. That's one of the reasons I hate him, because I saw what they did to a man that taught school for 36 years. All right, so I've got a personal ax to grind, too. I will confess that. I hear your argument. I've heard your argument. It's a valid argument. But part of the reason I bring those things up is because part of the anarchist impulse, part of the, the thought shift I'm trying to get out there is we are so disconnected from, in many ways, the means of production. And our disconnection from the means of production helps us to perpetuate a consumerist capitalist culture. So you and I may disagree on what to do about it, but at least raising the issue and having people understand what it costs somebody else for them to be able to get a $4.99 t-shirt at Walmart that was made in Cambodia or Indonesia or Vietnam or whatever is, you know, we can disagree on what to do about it, but I at least want to put it out there so when people are, are thinking about it, they're putting a face to that shirt yeah, and, and thinking about, yeah, okay. I mean, does that, can we, at least we can think about it. We may disagree on what to do about it, but let's at least try to put a face on that stuff that we're, that we're buying.